Uh, welcome to today's Private Equity Demystified webinar. I'm Derek Neal. I'm a partner in the tech and media team here at BDO. I specialize in helping companies to prepare for private equity and also help private equity firms to make investments. We're grateful to you all for joining. Um, it's a difficult time, a crisis for the human race and, and particularly horrible for anyone that's personally impacted. But you have shown great optimism in joining us today. It means you're thinking of the future. And as you'll hear from our speakers, then tech is very active at the moment. So it's a good time to be talking. Um, tech has already made the crisis, I think, much more manageable for millions of people and will be part of our way out of this. Um, it's a very important sector for BDO. We've got over 250 people across our UK offices focused on the sector and many more across the 167 countries that we operate in worldwide. Our aim today is to help you to start to decide whether private equity is the right move for you and your business. Today, we will be joined by Jamie Austin, an M&A partner and head of private equity here at BDO. Jamie will be setting the scene for us and explaining how private equity behaves and therefore how we can better understand how to deal with it. We are also joined by Paul Morris, head of growth advisory here and our TAME PE investor. Paul will be explaining what private equity investors are looking for in your business. And finally, we're delighted to welcome Phil Hollett, director at CSL Group, an M2M business that has recently completed a PE transaction um, in lockdown. Uh, Phil will be sharing his story as an entrepreneur who's taken his business through multiple rounds of private equity investment. A um, bit of admin, um, you know where your own fire exits are. Uh, we will be recording today's webinar. Um, if you have any questions, please send them through the Q&A function. Um, I will collate them and we'll come to questions at the end. They are all confidential and we will stop recording for the Q&A session. Um, we have an hour. So I will hand over to Jamie to kick us off. Hello. Um, I'm going to introduce myself by saying that I spend a lot of my time helping entrepreneurs navigate their ways into private equity and a lot of time helping them accelerate their growth and development whilst invested in by private equity and then almost as much time helping them realise uh, the gains of private equity on their way out. And actually, uh, I've been doing this for a long time. I feel that the entrepreneurs, people like you, really deserve the best out of private equity uh, to help you and your businesses thrive. So we're going to take you through a few slides here. Uh, Cathy Ann, can you move to the first slide, please? So there are many myths uh, that surround private equity, and uh, but we see it as a, a great way um, of funding uh, businesses and their growth. Um, and it has powered so many of the world's uh, greatest companies. If you just think to Formula One, the AA, Companies like Merlin Entertainment's all had private equity behind them. And in your own sector, the tech sector, um, you've got great stories uh, like with Skyscanner, um, which was a Scottish equity partners investment. Um, and also companies like Clarinet, one of our own, uh, our own clients, uh, which is the, the vehicle of Charles Nasser, who's a, who's a, a brilliant entrepreneur. Because it fosters change, this stuff, um, and it drives growth, it creates employment, um, builds value, and makes some people uh, really quite rich. Um, but it's super, uh, it's super unpopular with the press, and that's a great place to start a myth. And it's not, it's not surprising. Just recently, we've seen headlines like how private equity is winning in coronavirus and still boom time when the rest of us really are, are struggling, there are problems. And of course, uh, the horror stories, the one which really comes to mind is the Christmas present that was given to the employees of CityLink. Uh, on, they all received their redundancy notices on the 23rd of, of December. And then of course, there's the other end of the spectrum. 
I guess we've all got a friend of a friend who has simply made millions of pounds with private equity. And it's difficult to know what's real and um, really who to believe. So I think what, if I could just move on, Cathy Ann, to the next slide, please. Let's start with a few stats. So PitchBook collects a lot of stats. And just last month, they were saying that in the United Kingdom, 1.6 million people are employed by private equity backed businesses. And if you look behind some of the returns, what you'll see is the growth is much greater from private equity backed businesses. And equally, the, the, the returns are a lot higher, 3.4 times higher in some, in, some, in, 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 in some areas. And if you ask the people about private equity, the people who've been through it, an overwhelming majority of people would say, well, they would recommend it. And in fact, in our own research, what we see is, is mirrors this uh, in uh, the more entrepreneurial markets in which BDO um, works. Uh, and, and we see the greater growth, we see great, a great employment and this differ, differential from the rest of the economy. So really without these fast growing businesses and uh, their funding sources, uh, I think the UK economy would, would suffer. So really that, the, the misconception around private equity uh, as being asset strippers uh, in it just for themselves, I think is long out of date. So just moving on, Cathy Ann, please, just want to talk a little bit about the, the people. They are humans. I mean, there's a belief that somehow they are sort of psychopaths out, out for themselves. And it's it's just not true. Um, they're just humans like the rest of us. They do, on balance, tend to be highly intelligent uh, and mostly very, very well-educated people. They're also extremely experienced at what they do, uh, not surprisingly. And um, they are highly incentivized to make money after all the basic premise around private equity is to incentivize a small number of, of influential people to go through brick walls in the pursuit of value growth. And of course, we just need to pause for a second to think about it, that they're actually investing other people's money. In fact, they are really investing our money. Anybody who's got a pension, uh, probably some of that money has gone into private equity. And they suffer from this thing, asymmetry of information. They're always, they're always, um, looking from outside in. They are never going to know your business or your market as well as you do. And if any of them ever purport to say that they do, they're not the right people to be working with, I suspect. So moving on again, I just want to talk about, well, what does this mean about their behavior? So you've got this this, this situation and the impact is therefore that the private equity people are incredibly risk averse. Uh, they don't want to make mistakes. And they're also, in order to achieve that, they want to be systematic and incredibly, anybody who has worked in the private equity environment or had private equity backers will understand that they're extremely hard working. And of course, they really understand the rules. Um, in fact, in many cases, they put the rules together themselves. So they understand how leverage works how the legals, the intricacies of all the legals work. And they're putting the management team, you, into first loss uh, position. And it's pretty simple. If, if you're in private equity, that uh, if it's going well and you make money, you look good. But if things aren't going well, then you have to spend an enormous amount of your time solving the problems that uh, you may have caused, which keeps you away from investing, which is what they all really want to do. And, um, and not only can that uh, destroy somebody's career, but it also can bring down whole funds. And there are definite examples of those in the past. Cathy, can you move on one more, please? So just a quick look at the market. So today in the United Kingdom, you've got approaching a thousand different PE and uh, VC funds um, that are active. That's a hell of a lot, really. So that's six and a half thousand in the United States. 
And in the UK, they manage about £700 billion pounds of our money um, just in, in, in your sector in 18 and 19, over £5 billion pounds was invested. And there's a hell of a lot of it about that it still hasn't been invested. Um, some believe that there's as much as £100 billion pounds of, of uninvested capital sitting in these funds at the moment, this dry powder, as we call it. And a few examples there. So you've got uh, businesses like LDC uh, has about 500 million pounds to invest each year. In businesses worth somewhere between 10 and 100 million pounds. You've got Inflection, which has got uh, over three billion pounds to invest in an extraordinary growth story there because they started their business just about 20 years ago with 37 million pounds in their first fund. Stuff really does work and people um, do want to um, use it. Then of course you've got uh, the very big players like CBC, BC Partners, Premier Businesses, you, probably would have heard of all got billions to to invest so if you are interested in private equity you do have a lot of choice which is a great thing but of course it does make what is already quite a complicated process of decision just a little bit a little bit more uh, complex move on please but luckily this is what we call a tame problem in that it's been done a lot of times before. It is a, as it says up there, a well-trod path. So most things can be financially modeled. Um, and these, the most of the legal terms and the tax situation all been seen before. There's very little new out there. And maybe it's not so surprising, uh, but most of the behaviors are relatively predictable if you spend a lot of time working in the environment. And it's like other very complicated things to, to do, which have been tamed. Um, it's probably one that you need to get help uh, to, to do and get the best out of it. Let's move on, please. I'm gonna summarize now. Uh, so you've got this bunch of people who are highly incentivized, extremely smart investors. Um, you've got enormous quantities of money out there. And actually, there's a finite pool of interesting opportunities. And more so is the case today. There are really only two sectors uh, that are uh, coming up again and again and again. One of them is tech and the other one is, is life sciences. So. If you are in tech today, in many ways, you will have the upper hand. But, and it is a big but, this is not for every situation. It's certainly not for every person and every, every company. So there are a few things that we would encourage you to ask of yourself before you uh, took the plunge. I think there are five pretty sensible but relatively simple things. First of all, start right at the beginning. What is your definition of success? What are you trying to achieve? And then think about, well, how does private equity really help me achieve that? Do you need it? And then you have to think about what are the positives and negatives that private equity might bring and what the alternatives are. There are plenty of other funding sources out there. And lastly, and really importantly, and often forgotten is, can you get on with these people? You're likely to spend an appreciable amount of your time with them over what could be quite an extended period of time, three to five years. And talking of which, and I want to hand over to our poacher turned gamekeeper, Paul Morris. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. I think as both Derek and, and Jamie have alluded to, so I, I lead the growth advisory team here at BDO, where our focus is, is focused entirely on raising venture capital and private equity funds for growth businesses, predominantly tech. Um, and I've been doing that for two years, but prior to that, for 15 years, I was actually a partner in a firm called Living Bridge Private Equity, and I was invested in tech and tech-enabled businesses. So hopefully, as I take you through this session, 
Um, I'm reasonably well qualified to give you some advice as to how you can actually build a compelling investor story. But before we go through those slides, it's probably worth just dwelling on to say, well, there's two questions about this investor story. What, what do I mean by building a compelling investor story? Well, that's really about a very clear articulation narrative about your business and the opportunity in a very crisp and understandable format for investors. So they sort of get it immediately. Then we often get asked by clients, you know, why do we do this? These are professional investors. Surely if I just describe my business, they'll understand whether it's a good opportunity. Well, that misses the point slightly that actually most private equity firms have small numbers of investment teams and lots of opportunities to consider. So what you want to do by actually building this compelling story, which is in their language, if you like, is you lessen the risk that it will actually turn off quickly as they work out the opportunity cost of pursuing the opportunity because you've just had a misstep in terms of how you've actually described your business and the opportunity. So let's move to the next slide, please, Cathy Ann. So as described, this is almost exam questions. These are the questions that every investor will ask themselves when they come to an opportunity. So here I'm trying to sort of put you in the sort of shoes of an investor and maybe sort of through that lens, look at your own business and ask those questions. And the, and the main ones around market. So they ask the question about, is this market size going to restrict the growth of the business? Then is the business position to take advantage of that market growth? Are management capable of delivering the growth? So that's around the development of a, an ambitious growth plan and the execution of it. And then finally, the platform. And what I mean by platform is people, processes, systems, and supply chain. Are they able to support an aggressive growth plan? So on the next couple of slides, just moving on, um, I'm trying to sort of give you a bit of an aid memoir which hopefully you can use when you think about building your business plans and your investor decks. And we'll start with the market and the obsession, if you like, for many investors around total addressable market. What is that? Well, that is the, the defined market for your products and services. And it's a very abused term, I have to say. And you, you potentially lose credibility quickly if you're presenting, especially in the IT and tech space, that your market is global and it's multi-billion dollar because that just is trotted out all the time when in fact you've got a sort of specialized product which at the moment is focused on the UK in a certain vertical so you need to sort of get that down to that sort of funnel if you like of your properly addressable market and then you know why is that important because it's about runway so what an investor wants to see is that actually there's enough market size here for this business to grow maybe to 20 30 million of revenue and therefore if this is a 100 million pound market then that market sort of share is going to be so large, perhaps it's unfeasible. So that's what they're really focused on around total addressable market. Then there's, there's, if you like, presenting to the investor the fact that you can demonstrate that your market, the one you operate in, historically has grown and is likely to continue to grow in the forecast perspective. Because investors simply very rarely invest in there might be a large market, but if it's X growth, because what they really want to see is a sort of dual track benefit of the business, which is a market which is growing in itself and a business which is take, capable of taking market share. That's a really positive double whammy for any investor. And then the next point for me is this elevator pitch. It's right at the start of your conversation where you're just able to set the scene around the opportunity, which is you can articulate the problem, which the customer faces and and you know, why they want to buy your products. And then the fact that you are offering a solution, you describe how your products and your services deal with that problem for the client. And that is a really good start point for a conversation where an investor is gonna really understand what you're about. The positioning piece is then important because what, what you've got here is an investor saying, right, I, I like this market, it's big enough. Now let me look at this particular business and say, is this the right asset for me to invest in? And that's important because actually most investors will only tend to back one horse within a market because they are a shareholder and potentially sit on the board. They're not going to have two investments within competing businesses. It's just not feasible. So I feel through this sort of discussion, you can point out to them very clearly that you are the outstanding asset in which they should spend time thinking about making investment. So it's all about being able to identify and comment 
on your competition, you know, how you, you fare against them. The fact that it's not a marketplace which is full of 800 pound gorillas with deep pockets where you're not going to gain market share. And the way you demonstrate that is through a benchmarking marking exercise. So what that does, it provides objective data around how you compare to your peers. So you should be sort of demonstrating things such as sales growth, gross margins, net margins and customer attrition. It provides a really objective view on how you can compare against your competition. Another thing that investors are looking for, which would be great for you to position, is the scope to expand the core market through the life of their investment. So what you have is a situation where the investor will be potentially comfortable with the start point of the size of market, but they'll be even more excited about the opportunity if you can point to the fact that your products can actually be sold internationally, you're expanding the market. Or indeed, there's an opportunity for your products to iterate and evolve and be sold to a different cohort of customers, and then again, increasing the size of the core market. Next slide, Cathy Ann, please. Management. Everyone talks about the importance of management. Let me try and explain what that actually means in the, in the sort of, you know, the mind of an investor. You start with that sort of clear leadership and vision. That's your CEO, your founder. He or she has the ambition, the drive, the vision for the business. What in investors are not keen on is a situation which they might come to, which is four founders, all designated as joint MDs, all with 25% of the equity, all needing to agree to make any decision. That's not really conducive to a sort of dynamic decision-making process when you're trying to scale a business. So clear leadership is the start point. Then it's around the culture of the organization and it's particularly relevant in the tech space. So you need to determine whether or not, is this a tech or sales-led organization? So let me explain that spectrum. So on the, if it's focused almost exclusively on the tech, the danger is that you've got an over-engineered product, which is not got market fit. It's over-engineered, customers don't need it, they certainly won't pay the price. The other end of the spectrum, which is probably even less attractive, is a sales-led organization where the product is not particularly well-engineered, not particularly resilient, but there's an absolutely superb sales force with their go-to-market strategy. The danger with those businesses is they will gain early momentum, but because of the churn rates and the lack of any sort of reference sites, they won't continue to grow. Quite simply, investors want their cake and eat it. They want to see a blend of both a well-engineered market fitting product with strong go-to-market capability. Board formulation, a PE investor would expect to see the start of a C-suite when they invest. Uh, we used to talk a lot about our triumvirate, which is, your CEO, your CFO, and your chairperson, that's a good start. But if you're going to make your business attractive to P and support a high price, the more of that C-suite which you've appointed before they've invested, the better. So often one of those key functions to fill for a tech business is the sort of CTO or indeed the sales director. And then you step down a stage for that in terms of what they're looking for as investors. And that's that operational team. That's your second tier operational management the more of that you've got in your organization to start with, the more attractive you're going to be to PE investors. So that's sales managers, service delivery managers, those people who you don't expect to effectively develop the strategy, but they can independently execute on the strategy. Platform, you know, back to what I said previously, that's around your sort of people, your processes, your systems. And the technology in the platform has two facets. The internal piece, which is around the systems that you use within your business, they don't expect that to be sort of bespoke and developed yourself. That could be Microsoft, it could be Oracle. But what they're looking for is as much of your interactions with your supply chain, your customer, internal admin functions such as order taking and pricing can be done in an automated fashion, leads to a business that can scale quite quickly. Then the other side of the tech discussion is the product itself. And the fact that you can elaborate on and point to the USPs within the tech through IP protection, but also equally importantly, you've got a predetermined tech roadmap. Because what an investor is looking for is at the point they invest, there is a sustainable competitive advantage. That means now and in the future. So the tech roadmap, it's a fairly dynamic, lots of sectors, you know, fast growth within technology. Probably it's between a 12 and a 36 month roadmap where you can articulate what needs to be done to the product to stay ahead of the game, what the costs are associated with it, and how you're going to do this and execute it 
Do you have the internal resource or do you need to recruit? Another factor around platform is financial and operational control. What investors want to see is that you can grow quickly, but profitably in ca with cash generation. So you've got good control. So this is good financial information, management accounts, audited accounts, decent financial forecasts, which you continually revisit. But beyond just the financials, the better businesses in the eyes of PE investors are those with the operational control and understand their levers. So there are key performance indicators around the sales team, you know, managing the pipeline, conversion, customer acquisition costs, lifetime value. If you're able to articulate those aspects, that's really quite compelling. And then also from the support side, if you've got a support function with service level agreements in play, then one would expect that they are clearly um, developed and understood by the business and you don't have a situation where you have an SLA, but it's the client who tells you that you've breached them. That's not very attractive to PE. Scope for bolt-on. So the, the point I make here is that PE like dual track growth strategies. They are attracted to organic growth, but equally, if you've got some idea around acquisitions and you've got a platform that's well invested so that you can bolt on acquisitions quite comfortably and integrate them and take out much of the overhead base, so gross profit drops to the bottom line, that's quite compelling. The final area here is around profit and cash. You know, it goes without saying, but what does that mean? So what you have here is, just to step back a bit, Cathy, I'm sorry. The, um, what, the VC world is less concerned about profitability, cash generation. They, are, they, they understand that uh, during their ownership, loss making, cash burn is probably still gonna be the, the case. And often valuations are around revenue multiples. But a P investor is further down that sort of maturity cycle. So they might accept a short period of time, the start of their investment whole period, where it's not cash generative or loss making, but they wanna see a clear pathway that by the end of four or five years when they sell, then yes, there may be a revenue multiple, but it'll also be triangulated by profitability. The business needs to be making decent levels of profit. The tech space is very fortunate around the fact that most of the models are asset light, but it doesn't do any harm to reinforce this in your discussions by talking about the fact that you can grow in a not a very capital consumptive way. So your working capital cycle is fine. Also, when you take on new clients, there isn't a whole amount of time and cost associated with contract setups. Margin dilution is another indicator of uh, interest for an investor historically and going forward. What they don't, what they're not attracted to is a, is a growth at the expense of profit, whether it's gross margin or net margin. In fact, what they're looking for is as the business grows with economies of scale and leverage in your overhead base, then actually these margins improve. And the final area of, of real importance is around quality of earnings and being able to demonstrate in these early conversations how and where you make your money. And really the best way I can describe this is it's almost in three buckets potentially of earnings. There's a contractual piece, which is very attractive to an investor. This is the sort of fixed contractual part of your business. Then there's the repeatable recurring piece, which might not be fixed, but does associate itself with a customer relationship or a contract, maybe some professional services. And then the least attractive, but obviously it's a feature sometimes is that one-off project setup type piece. The more of the two former categories that you've got, the more you're likely to underpin uh, interest and a high valuation. So I hope you find that useful. Um, there's a lot there in the aid memoir, but if you start thinking through some of these questions ahead of any interaction with an investor, I think that you lessen the risk that that investor finds that they've got something more interesting to look at. Thank you, and I'll now hand on to Phil. Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am Phil Hullett. Uh, I was the CEO of uh, CSL Dualcom and now a now executive director for CSL. And as you contemplate your journey in this PE world, uh, I am probably how you want to end up. The, uh, I'm healthy and reasonably well off, and most importantly, still married and my kids still talk to me. And I got some, I don't have slides, I have some notes. I'm gonna to refer to these notes because it's easy to talk a lot and I've got a short amount of time to get across some, some messages, which I think might be helpful to you. Uh, I've gone from CEO to non-executive director. 
gone from intuitive and intelligent to wise, probably a factor of age, I suspect. Uh, I've been a buyer and a seller multiple times in the same transaction, and I've had a field process. Uh, and probably seen most of the, the things uh, in the PE industry. Uh, if I dial back to when we started in 2005, when I heard about PE, I remember taking the finance director by the neck, putting him against the wall and saying, what don't I know? This can't be true. And, and when, it, uh, when you got into it, it was true. Uh, but it's an acquired taste and not for everyone. Uh, as I think uh, Paul referred to before, or, uh, or Jamie, I think it was, the reputation for PE back in the day wasn't brilliant and their motivation was questioned. Uh, the, uh, I, we have one particular instance where a, a lead investor, his strategy was to replace the management team with new people to, to drive new growth. Uh, then when that didn't work, he looked to put his into administration, receivership and take over all the shares. And we're still here, he's fired. Uh, but again, how it's evolved in PE, the biggest asset in any, in any company is a management team. Everybody now knows it's the one number one asset. Uh, and when PE buy a company, they're backing you. They're backing the management. Uh, it's worth understanding some of the basic premises. I thought in my hands, by the way, I started with that. Uh, when PE backs your company, it is worth zero. That, so what they pay is equal to the value of the company. So they start with zero, which means they have to generate a return. And they generate the return by growing your company. And the only people who can do that is you. Um, there, is, there is probably three different stages with PE. First, it's making a decision. I call that the dance. Uh, second is executing on your strategy, which is the marriage, and then exiting the relationship, which spookily is called the divorce. Uh, and the dance, the dance, uh, you have to decide if you want PE or if PE really want you. In the first instance, as everybody said, get yourself advisors, get yourself good advisors. And you have to make sure your advisors are part of the PE circle. Uh, and what I mean by that is the, um, uh, there's this thing called reciprocity in the PE world. So everybody knows everybody. Uh, and I've worked with BDO many times, very good by the way. I have uh, also had BDO on the other side of the table, very good by the way, sadly for me. However, because everybody knows everybody, everybody does the right deal. Everybody understands, there's nothing new. Everything, is, everything has happened before. We, we, fought and, we fought and lost in the same issues on both sides of the table. However, if you bring an advisor to the table who's not part of the circle, there's no reason for, for anybody to do a fair deal. And uh, therefore you need to make sure your advisor is a proper PE advisor. Um, I have, uh, I guess, uh, when you're doing these transactions, you are a buyer and a seller during the transaction. And someone like BDO will say, they are rewarded basically if the transaction is successful. It may get something if it's not, but uh, like all of the parties, all the advisors in these transactions, they get rewarded for success. So they, it's in their interest to tell you if it's not gonna be successful, don't bother, because they will waste Resource. So if they say to you, if you get the right advisors who are in the PE circle, and they say your company is going to be good for PE, they're basically putting their costs and their relationship on the line. So you can take from a good advisor, good advice, and they will help you pick out PE companies. Some are good, some are better, some are not so good. Uh, in my experience, the advisor costs uh, and a transaction around 5% in total. So in a 30 million pound transaction, advisor costs 
will be roughly 1.5 million. And you have to earn that back before you add any value. So make sure you choose well. So assuming you are PE material and uh, you start talking about to some potential investors, some rules and tips under promise. I think some of the things may have been covered before, but from personal experience and scares down my back, under promise. Disclose everything, right? Don't, there's no good stuff or bad stuff. Anything good or bad needs to be talked about. If it's good, they still get upset if you tell them about it later. If it's bad, they get really upset if you tell them about it later. Focus on what made you PC material, PE material. Right? Don't meander into all the crap that perhaps you might do. Stick to what you're good at. You have to be, as I said, a buyer and seller in, in the transactions. So what I mean by that is when you are selling your company, you're selling your company, this is why it's great. Then you have to think about, okay, now the PE company is my partner. I now have to pay that money back. So all of a sudden, I don't want to oversell it because if I oversell it, I don't get paid the money back, I work hard for nothing. So you have to balance that relationship between leaving your current partners and moving to your PE partner. And leave some fairy dust on the table. <laughs> Fairy dust is all the things I think, uh, uh, I think Paul referred to, or Jimmy referred to in uh, as uh, being able to go into other sectors and other job fields. Um, I call that long-term strategy. Every PE investor I spoke to called it fairy dust. But, well, we'll discount all of that. However, they need to know it's there so that when they go to sell you in four or five years time, they know there's some growth opportunities to add. And finally, before you get into any transaction, something no one talks about, but you need to do this. You need to have the conversation at home, right? Explain to your loved ones. They are not gonna see much of you for the next five years. However, if it works out well, you'll be financially set up for the rest of your life. They need to keep in contact with your friends and, your, and, and, and basically your family, because you're not gonna see them for five years. So don't just think making all this money is easy. That's the deal. So I, I did that 16 years ago, still married, and now starting to talk to my kids again. And it's, uh, it's tough, it's really hard. We had a finance director who uh, worked from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., but went on holidays and turned his phone off. That lasted for a year. After that year, he had his phone on every day on holiday, and he was working, and we all were. And you will work night and day until you deliver results. So if you have friends, and you have good friends and family time at the end of this thing, it's probably because you're far and sometimes you want it for not committing enough. So that's what you need to think about. Have that conversation. Make sure you, everybody understands what you're getting stuff into. So if you picked a partner, you've done a deal, and you had the conversation, and your company is now worth zero, <laughs> what's next? Again, some tips. Growth is everything. Your company is valued at a multiple of your profit, your EBITDA, and the multiple. So if, for example, when you, this 30 million pound transaction we talked about, if your EBITDA was 3 million and multiple is 10, you have an enterprise value of 30 million. If you work really hard and you double the EBITDA, which is what everybody wants, to 6 million. Uh, however, growth is now limited because I think we talked about uh, like that earlier, you outgrow your market to start, it goes X growth, as it's called, and the multiple drops to six, your company is now worth 30 million again. Adds some interest to your debt, you've done nothing, and you work five years for zero. So working really hard, you have to make sure that you have areas to grow into, and you have to make sure that those areas have a, a runway, not just for the next investor, because they'll be looking to say, well, they, you need a 10-year runway at any given time. And you have to be able to show that and demonstrate it. Get a chairman. Uh, I don't know how to describe it. So, so he or she is a buffer uh, between you and your investors. And I gotta tell you, you will need it. There will be times where you will absolutely not agree with your investors. And there are very, very a lot of times when they will not want to do agree with you. The chairman is the guy who puts the messages. It's expensive, it's gonna be some equity, absolutely worth it. Get a chairman. Double down on what you're good at. 
uh, double down. Um, in our first investment, uh, myself and my partner made a commitment. We would not leave the UK. There's just so much business. By the way, the, uh, our competitor was beat. Ours was Red Care, or BT Red Care, as it was called. The 800 gorilla, pound gorilla smashed them. Uh, it took a long time, 10 years. But uh, we did that by focusing on what we said we'd do. And we won that market in our own geography first before we started going international. If you deliver your and execute on your strategy, you will deliver what you said you would do. And, and as long as you have some good growth, there's no reason why you won't be able to sell again. You have to lead. Private equity will not lead you. You may have been in a company before where there's other people who had leads. You have to lead. And I know from personal experience as CEO, it is lonely. Right? There's nobody really you can talk to. So you lead. Do not let anyone else leave. You leave. Focus on the prize all the time. Focus on cash. Having great EBITDA and going bust isn't good fun. So focus, make sure you have the cash to do what you need to do. Over communicate. Never let your PE partners think uh, uh, to fill in a vacuum because you haven't filled it in, because they will fill it in with, with crap and you will get so much work is not true. So over communicate, but control the flow of information. Don't tell them so, uh, like these three letter acronyms. You say something like that to them, they don't know what it means. They have to go find out. You get a ton of work for nothing. Make sure you have that control of information that goes. To, they get what they need to hear, but they never hear something from someone else. So if you've had a success, a successful investment cycle, and you're now in about year four-ish, and I think as you probably have seen, you need to start thinking about your exit. Um, I, we, we have always aimed to do it in four years. In our last three cycles, it was five years, five years, and the last one was four years. And the investor was a bit of an idiot, so that's why that happened. And the, uh, this one, uh, we're hoping for four, probably five. Um, you need to plan the exit or the divorce. And with every divorce, it can work well, it can be very messy. And it always comes down to timing and value. And by the way, at no point, uh, I think it was referred to by Paul earlier, don't think you're anything other than an asset. That's what you are. Uh, you are transactional. They will never see you again. So what they're looking for is the best possible return. So therefore, it's up to you to drive the exit because they'll want to hold you um, for their at the best time for them, which is not necessarily the best time for you. So go, go uh, there's a company called Megabyte. I think everybody knows them in the, in the PE industry. Go sign up, put your stuff out there uh, so people can see you, see your progress over the five years. Uh, have um, uh, you, You'll find that you will have seen a number of PE companies before you do a transaction. Uh, they will have dramatized the day you did it and when the two, three, four, and five year anniversaries are and they will be calling you. So don't worry about uh, having to go around. They will find you. Your advisors will find you as well. If you had good advisors, go back to BDO. Uh, they are good. There's others, by the way, but, but they're pretty good. Uh, they're very good. Sorry, Jerry. I know. They, uh, and um, they'll find you. If you're doing the deals and signing to another PE again, just the, uh, the most interesting and interesting transaction ever. Uh, both want to do the best deal ever. So you want you, your responsibility is make sure that the actual P company that's buying you gets a fair deal and the one that's selling you gets a good deal. And both of them have to trust you, which is what you've built up over the five years and now you built up, uh, you're starting to build up for your, for your new partner. And then you dance again. So I would say in summary, uh, do your referencing, do it well. Uh, do it on your advisors, with your advisors, on your PE companies. Have the conversation at home. And I can't emphasize, I've seen more divorces and crap uh, because of you know, this than anything else. Just have that conversation uh, because it does take, uh, you will have an impact on you and your performance in the company, which is what most people think about. Focus on what you're good at and deliver the expectation. Anything more that's great, 
deliver the expectation and plan your exit, uh, both for the company and personally. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. That was great. And thank you, Jamie and Paul, too. We hope you enjoyed today's webinar. Please do get in touch with Paul, me or Jamie if you'd like to go through any of the topics that we went through today. A recording of the webinar will be shared. And finally, thank you very much for joining us.